glory, glory, yeah. Sit down if you can. <laughs> Thank you, boy. John, you've never done better, brother. I'm telling you, that's awesome. And Justin, I guarantee you, you guys, the band blessed us. They always do. They're just, mm. I'm telling you, and those guys, you know, live what they sing, and we know them, and that's the greatest thing about it is that the people that minister to you, the great thing about the local church is that you, you know them, and you know their lives, you know who they are, you know what they stand for. You see them over years worth of time, and uh, it just blesses you, and I, I hope it does. I, it always blesses me, I can tell you that for sure. And it's such a joy to be able to come up and share the word after um, such, a, such a dynamic group as we have that uh, ministers to us every Sunday. You know, I, 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 know that, I know that there are better bands, most likely, in the land. You know, there may be better singers or better players or whatever it might be. But on a week-after-week week activity and in a church our size, I guarantee you we are indeed most blessed yeah, yeah. of all in the world. And if we could just get us a preacher, we would be good. We could really go somewhere. I'm you. <laughs> yeah, we could get, oh, bless your heart. I appreciate it. Anyway, yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I, you call it fishing for a compliment. Yeah. All right. Last week we looked at uh, uh, that little insidious thing that happens so, uh, so quickly in our life without us even noticing. We talked, I'm talking about drifting. And last week I shared with you concerning drifting and how not to drift. And uh, we decided that there was one principle, and that one principle was, uh, if I'm not going to drift, I must pay attention. That's the one principle, and then there were three ways to apply that, or three tools to help us in applying that. One is we need some reference points, you know, and so we can tell where we are. If you don't have any reference points, you look up, you don't know if you're between the trailer and the coconut. And if that doesn't make any sense, just get look at it. Like, look at it again from last week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are you between the trailer and the coconuts? And then I uh, suggested that you get someone, a Christian, another Christian in your life, that uh, is skilled in the area of your weakness. Uh, obviously, because uh, you can fool people uh, if they don't know what what it is they're looking for, looking at. I mean, you know, some people have you you have things going on in your life that. Maybe they're not familiar with, and they wouldn't recognize the signs of it if, if they saw them. So, I mean, don't just, you can't just get anybody. You have to get someone who, who knows what you're going through and who can see these things before they happen and can challenge you about them, and you've given them permission to do this, and that'll help you a lot. And then pray for discernment, which is the ability to see something happen before it happens, and courage to change it no matter what. Now, now, now. Uh, why do we worry about that? Why, why, why are we concerned about, about our life and where it is and whether we're drifting or whether we're where we need to be? Well, it is because in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, one of many places, uh, the, the Bible tells us that we're going to stand before the Lord one day and that we as Christians are going to stand at a judgment seat called the Bema judgment of God. Now, we all know about the great white throne that's in the book of Revelation where all of the lost stand before the Lord one day and the books are open and they're judged from what the works that are written in the book and they're not found written in the Lamb's book of life and so they don't go to heaven. And that's a great eternal judgment at the end of all things. But the Bible also talks to us as Christians and says that one of these days we as Christians are going to stand before the Lord. Now, it's not going to be a great white throne, and we're not going to be lost. It's going to be the Bema judgment, which just simply means a seat of rewards. And, and, and if you're not a Christian, you won't even be there. So it's not a question as to whether you're lost or saved. If you're not saved, you won't, all, you won't even be there. But, but according to Jesus, he said he's going to open up, and, and, and our works are going to be judged by fire. And the fire is going to try or test every man's work of what sort it is. And he said, if your work is wood, hay, and stubble, it's going to be burned up. If it's gold, silver, and precious stone, it's going to rise to the glory of God. So the reason we're concerned about whether our life drifts or whether we're where we need to be and doing what we need to do and we're what God's called us to be and we're moving with him is because one day we'll stand before him and I don't know about you, but I don't want to hear the Lord say done or half done. <laughs> I want to hear him say well done. well done. 
Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of heaven. That's what I want to hear Jesus say. So it matters because one day we're, our lives are going to be evaluated not based on what we think about them or what the world thinks about them or what our friends think about them or our teachers think about them, but according to what God has designed us for. In other words, God has designed us for a productive life. We as Americans are concerned about productivity in all areas of life. We have a metric that comes out every month. Our government produces a, a, a metric about our national um, financial life, productivity life. It's called the GDP, the gross domestic product, which is a measurement, a monetary measure. I don't want to get too technical, but it's a monetary measurement that basically includes all the goods and services that happen within the borders of the United States. It's just a big old financial number that tells us whether we're doing all right or not about the, about the economic health of our nation. Well, what if we had a, a, a GIP, a gross uh, individual product? I mean, you know, let's suppose we had one for our life. What would yours say? What would it say? Would it be, would it be a plus? Would you be, would you be doing well or would it be a minus? Would it, would it show that you've grown in life this week, that this has been a good month for you and you've grown and you move forward, or would it show a decline in life? The reason I ask this is because many of us as Christians really have never considered whether our lives are productive or not. I know this is astounding to think this way and imagine this way, but for most of us, really, most of us don't ever evaluate our lives as to whether we have been productive for the Lord. As a matter of fact, I'm going to submit to you today that many of us are not even aware of what it is that the Lord wants us to produce in life. And so we're going around praying, Lord, bless me, or Lord, use me, or God, take me, or God, whatever we might say, and we don't have any idea what we're talking about because we don't even know what the Lord expects out of our life. And so we're easily seduced by people that tell us, well, the Lord wants you to be wealthy. The Lord wants you to be healthy. The Lord wants you to be a millionaire. The Lord wants you to have great fame. The Lord wants you to be a part of this gigantic movement. I mean, just about anything we'll swallow if we don't really know what the Lord expects out of our life. And we'll believe almost any trickery of false theology that <laughs> takes a verse here and a verse there and a moment here and a moment there. And you can almost say anything. You know, I could, I could start a set today of uh, people hurriedly going out and committing suicide and it being the things of God. You know, Judas went out and hung himself, the Bible says. That's in the Bible. And then it says, what, what thou do, uh, go and do likewise. And then it says, what thou do, do as quickly. So there you go. There's the theology of going out and hanging yourself like right. Judas did quickly. But it's all based on a bit here and a bit here and a bit here. You know all those things don't go together, Right. Well, if we don't know what the Lord expects out of our life, then we are easily fooled by people and theology and thoughts and the enemy's attack that tells us we're not doing so good. Or you need something else in your life, and then here's what it is, and you're drawn away, and you waste your life. So I want to read a couple of verses first out of John 15, and I know that many of you that know the Bible, you know that John 15 is a chapter in which Jesus teaches us about productivity. He teaches us about producing in the Christian life. And it's all wrapped up in, a, in an analogy about a vine and some branches. You remember this? And he said that he was the vine and we're the branches and, and we're attached to him. And if we stay attached to him, we're going to produce much fruit and so forth. And if we're not attached to him, we're not, we can't do anything by ourselves, you know? Well, here are a couple of verses that, that I think hone in uh, on a, a little bit fuller content of this. I, I want you to see this to start with. We're talking about, you know, what, what does the Lord expect out of us? What is God's purpose for us? Uh, what, does God, what would be a productive life according to what God says he expects out of us? Let's look at verse 8. By this, this is Jesus speaking, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. So verse 8 tells us in order to be a disciple of Christ, God expects us to bear much fruit. And when we bear much fruit, 
then people will see our lives and see the fruit that we're bearing, and they will glorify God because of what they see out of our lives, and that is what creates a disciple, Jesus said. Now look at verse 16, same chapter. Jesus said, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. That's good, isn't it, right? You thought you chose Christ, right? Yeah, <laughs> you thought you were the one that chose him because one day you walked down an aisle to an altar and prayed and asked the Lord to come in, or you prayed at your home, or you prayed at a tent revival meeting somewhere, or, or in some place you prayed and asked Christ to enter your life. And you're thinking, I chose Jesus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. That's like you found Jesus too. You know, you didn't find Jesus, he found you. And if he couldn't run faster than you could, you'd have never found him because you were running away from him as fast as possible. We were all sinners. <laughs> Christ died for us. Jesus said, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. So what is, what, what is God's message and ministry for us? What is God's, uh, what is God's uh, uh, marching orders for us? Go and bear much fruit. God says, I chose you. You didn't choose me because I want you to go and bear much fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. There's one of those theology verses. I know you've heard it a bunch. I'm just asking Jesus' name and Jesus will give it to you. Is that what that verse says? Uh, no. Because it, it has a context, right? And I don't want to make a lot out of the context, but I just want to show you while we're passing by that that verse does not tell you that you can ask anything in Jesus' name and God's going to give it to you. That verse says that if you're going to bear much fruit like God told you to and you need something to help you bear that fruit, you can ask for that in Jesus' name and God will give it to you. If you need it to bear more fruit, if you need it to glorify his name in a greater way, then you can ask in Jesus' name. Jesus' name means all that Jesus is and all that Jesus expects. So if I can ask, for, if, it, if it's what Jesus wants and what Jesus expects in life, then I can ask. If it's not, God, give me a gold Cadillac. Well, is that something Jesus wants? No. No. Well, all right, am I going to get it? No. Lord, give me a better life. Give me a sharper mind. Give me a greater spirit. Give me more love, more joy, more peace, more long-suffering. Are those things that Jesus wants? Sure they are. So can I expect to get them? Sure I can. Just be careful because I'll tell, show you what happens when you start praying stuff like that in just, in, just a few, in just a few minutes. But anyway, God's marching order is that we would go and that we would bear fruit and our fruit would remain. Well, there's a lot of talking about fruit going on here. And you might come to the conclusion that uh, what God wants us to do in the life has something to do with this fruit that he keeps talking about, about bearing fruit in life. What in the world is fruit? Well, fruit is used about, the word fruit is used 66 times in the New Testament. It's used about 230 times in the Old Testament. I'm just telling you that. So you can go, wow, that's a lot. I'm just saying the Bible talks a lot about fruit. It's not just a little isolated deal here in John 15. It's all over the word. And there are basically three categories of fruit that God mentions as he mentions it all these times. One is um, uh, a um, natural fruit, which is like figs, grapes, pomegranates, uh, you know, uh, fruit you eat, fruit you, just, just like fruit we eat. The second category is biological fruit, which is like fruit of the womb, which are babies and children, and they're the fruit of our lives. And the third kind of fruit that's mentioned is spiritual fruit. Spiritual fruit is the fruit that Jesus produced by the character of his life. Let me show you what I mean. There are, there are two mechanisms that Jesus produced while he was here on earth that when he left were in jeopardy of not being able to be continued. One is the gifts of the Holy Spirit and one is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Now, the fruits of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit are not the same thing. Please hear that. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are the works that Jesus did while he was here on earth. 
the healing the blind, the clear, cleansing of the lepers, the raising of the dead, the, the, the healing of the lame, you know, the feeding the five. The miracles of Jesus were the works of the Holy Spirit. And, and when Jesus left, the Holy Spirit that empowered Jesus remained here, and the Holy Spirit that empowers Jesus empowers our life and fills our life. Not a different Holy Spirit, not, not, not a halfway Holy Spirit, not a, not a left behind Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that, that empowered Jesus' life empowers our life. And it produces gifts at opportune times and opportune moments and, and in times where the Spirit of God and the purpose of God manifests itself that a gift would need to be given. God gives these gifts and works these wonders to recreate what Jesus did while he was here on earth. But not only did this earth need what Jesus did, this earth needed what Jesus was. And what Jesus was, according to Galatians chapter 5, was a collection of fruit that the Holy Spirit manifests in life. And I submit to you that the world not only needed what Jesus did, the world needed what Jesus was. And so when Jesus left this earth, the Holy Spirit empowers us with gifts that give us the ability to recreate the works of Jesus. And he gives us fruit of the Spirit so that we can re recreate the personality of Jesus. In order to do what Jesus did, you got to be what Jesus was. And he said, here they are, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. Against such there is no law. So God says, all right, here is, here is the definition of a productive life, that we bear much fruit. What is God after in our life when he saves us? That we would bear the fruit of his Spirit living on the inside of us. And that as we bear it, people would see it, people would be changed, people would believe, people's lives would be transformed, people would have a testimony of the greatness and the, and the goodness and the gentleness and the love of God in their life, and that we would go everywhere bearing this, these, these fruit of the Spirit and that those fruit would remain and that people's lives would be changed. And so God's production of our life, and if we live a productive life, what is the productive life he's talking about? And that is that we would bear much fruit. And it's this fruit that he's talking about. So how about you? Since you've been saved, are you any more loving than you were before you got saved? Any more joyful? Is it is the joy of the Lord any deeper in your life than when you first came to Christ? How about peace? Do you have more peace now? than you did the moment that Jesus saved you? Or long-suffering? Are you more long-suffering now or less? Are gentle, are good, are kind, are merciful, are, are, are under control in your life? This is what God identifies as a productive life. So you want to be productive in life? What would we need to do in order to produce good fruit in life? Well, let me give you the four, four little conditions of fruitfulness, all right? These are just simple little things. You say, I want to be productive. I want to be what Christ created me to be. I want to bear fruit in my life. I want to bring honor and glory to God by bearing the fruit that he tells me is important, the spiritual fruit of my life. So what do I need to do? All right, there are four, four growing environments, four things you need to do so that the fruit the, so that, that your life might grow and produce good fruit. All right, number one, I must cultivate roots. I know that's not very sexy and glamorous to tell you that. You say, wow, preacher, <laughs> tell me something exciting. You should cultivate roots. Well, no root, no fruit. I mean, there's not much, there's not much competition with that, Right? Well, listen to what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah chapter 17. This is a really interesting thing about the roots in our life. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Now, in the New Testament, the word blessed means uh, happy. It's markirios. So it means pretty much the same thing in the Old Testament. You can be happy. Happy are you. Blessed are you if you trust the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. This is what this person's going to be like. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spread out its roots by the river, and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green, 
and will not be anxious in the year of drought. Everybody say, that's a long time. In the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. So what is Jeremiah talking to us about? Jeremiah is saying, in order to have good fruit, you have to have good roots. Why is it that I need roots? Well, all of us know that, that roots are the lifeline of nourishment that feeds the entire plant. And then without roots, plants can't live. But according to verse 8, that in times of trouble, it's really important that you would have roots. And he, Jeremiah describes the times of troubles as times of heat and times of drought. Now let me ask you, have you ever felt the heat of life? Life can get hot, can it? Yeah, I'm talking about those pressures of life. I'm talking about that, that time when, the, when things just squeeze in you, in on you, press in on you. I'm talking about when the heat is on in your life, like somebody you die, somebody you love dies, or that person who said that they would never leave you and never forsake you, and that they loved you more than anything. They served you with divorce papers. Or when you got laid off of your job, right, when you just bought a new automobile or a new car, and you're wondering, how in the world am I going to ever? Man, life can get hot, and the bills just keep piling up, piling up, piling up. The kids won't stop screaming, and the, and the boss won't quit uh, uh, bugging you about some kind of report, and the IRS just sent you a letter in the mail. I'm talking about hot times of life is what I'm talking about. Man, life can get hot quick. So why do we need great roots? Because in times of heat, in times of trouble, it's roots that keep us grounded and fed in life. And also he says, not only in times of heat, but in times of drought. I mean, dry spells are one thing, but drought is a whole different animal, right? When you have a drought, everything dries up, stuff dies, you have to learn how to live without things that you normally depend on. I normally depend on what? My health. Well, in a drought, I might not have my health. I have a spouse. I depend on my spouse. Well, in droughts, I might not have a spouse. In time, I may not have a job. I'm, I'm, I may not have a support system. I mean, in times of drought, things that we normally depend on just seem to not be there. And so we just kind of cripple along in times of drought uh, uh, limited with limited income and limited energy and, and limited money and limited life. And anybody can survive a couple of weeks, right? <laughs> anybody can survive a couple of weeks of drought. But how about a year of drought? Extended stress. Extended anxiety. Back in 1983, I went on a mission trip out to Arizona. I was talking with Brian about this the other day. Brian uh, knows all about Arizona. He's lived there. How long did you live there, Brian? 13 years. I was asking about this. Because back in 1983, and it, it, so there were some things about it I couldn't really remember, and I just wanted to touch base with him. But, but we went out to the Navajo Indian Reservation back then. They had a flash flood. A flash flood in Arizona happens when you have about two inches of rain. That's a flash flood. <laughs> remember, they're mountains, and they're deserts, and they don't have a lot of you know, foliage and so forth. And so if you have a two-inch rain on the top of a mountain, it just runs right straight down the mountain. As a matter of fact, they have the strangest roads out there. They, have, they don't have a lot of bridges. They have a lot of dips in the road like this. And these dips are waterways. You can look up, you know, you can look and you can see kind of like a waterway, waterway. But of course, 99.99% .99 of the times they're dry as a bone. But if you have a big rain on top of that mountain, you better be careful because when they say flash flood, they mean flash flood. They mean like when that water starts rolling down off the top of that mountain, that might be a 12-foot wave coming down through there, and you drag in that moment about that time, and boy, there you go down the mountain. Well, I went, we went out there, and what happened is on the Indians' homes, they had these flat top adobe kind of tops, and you know they have the little uh, four-inch outlets where water can run off the top, and most of the time they don't have any trouble with that because it rains so fr uh, so uh, less frequently, and it, and, it, and it just rains a tiny little bit, and the water can run off the top of their flat top houses easily. But when they have a lot of rain, like two inches of rain, all that water piles up on top of that roof. It can't get out fast enough, and it caves the roof in. 
So we were out there to help on this Indian reservation, some Christian Indians that belonged to the mission, a Christian mission there, and we went out there to help rebuild those roofs. Well, we went through, we went through the most interesting thing, and the reason I brought this up is when we, on our way out there, we, of course, we're going down I-10, and as we approach uh, Tucson, uh, we, we look on both sides of the interstate, and they're just like mountainous areas and hills, and, big, and they are just covered with these giant cactuses. Or cacti, I guess is what it'd be. Man, these things like this big around, they're just gigantic, 50 feet tall. These are, these are saguaro cactuses, which are like the roadrunner. If you've ever watched the roadrunner, it's those with the arms that stick up like this. You know, that's a saguaro cactus. And, it, and that thing will grow about 50 feet tall, and it'll look like an oak tree out there. And it takes it a, a, about 95 to 100 years to shoot one arm up. And some of these things have 10, 12 arms, you know. I mean, they just, you know, and they may be, and, and they may be as, as close as to 200 years old. These things are just gigantic. But anyway, my point is that these things, uh, a lot of them had flowers. And this is called the Saguaro National Forest on both sides. And there was lots of vegetation out there of all kinds. There were like the, uh, tumbleweeds, just rolling old dried up, brittle tumbleweeds rolling, being blown out, out through there. And you know, you know what happened? They had no roots whatsoever. And they just blew with old hot wind. And then there, but these saguaro cactuses were blooming. They had like little flowers and stuff. And they were blooming and alive right there in the middle of all of that arid, hot, burning desert. You know why? Because they have roots. And those roots go about 40 or about 50 to 60 feet in every direction. And so they can bear fruit in 130 degree weather out there. How do you cultivate roots? You need it in the heat of life. You need it in the drought of life. You need it when, 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 the, when the drought of life deprives you of things. And when the heat of life pressurizes you on something, think about it. Think about what causes you to fail many times in life. Isn't it the deprivation of things? You're deprived. You don't have enough. You're sad and lonely and rejected and miserable. What is it that you need in a time of deprivation? You need some roots to feed you in spite of the fact that the, that the hot wind is blowing pressure into your life. So how do you cultivate roots? Well, in Psalms 1, David gives us a really good word about how to cultivate some roots. Look at what he says. Here we go. We're blessed again. Happy is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight, look here, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Uh-oh. So if I'm going to be a blessed person, then I don't walk with the sinners. I don't sit in their scornful seats ridiculing the things of God. I don't stand in the paths and follow along where they go. My delight is in the law of God. God has a law. It's written in his word. I, I meditate on his word. I memorize his word. I, I, I honor his word. I, I read his word. I obey his word, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And look at this. And in his law, he meditates day and night, all the time. What is David saying? Let me just go and read the rest of it. I, I put the, it's only six verses, so hang on, seven. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. There we go. That brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Could you stand a little bit of that? Yeah. Holy Ghost, yeah. The ungodly are not so. I just put this so you can see the, the, the difference. The ungodly are not so, but they're like the chaff which the wind drives away. Everybody say tumbleweed. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So how do I cultivate good roots? I meditate on the Word of God. I memorize the Word of God. I study the Word of God. I obey the Word of God. I'm encouraged by the Word of God. I hear messages concerning the Word of God. I give myself to the things that God would say to me because roots enable me to withstand the heat of pressure and the deprivation of life. 
which I know I'm going to face in this world that we live in. All right, second. First, cultivate roots. Number two, eliminate weeds. Yep, not sexy at all, right? <laughs> mm. Not hard either. I mean, to, to know, uh, maybe a little bit more difficult to do because we love weeds. Yeah, our lives are filled with weeds. Yeah. Those things that occupy us, you know, those things that distract us, those things that fill our life up so much that, Pastor, I, I would love to come, but I just don't have time. Well, if you don't have time, you do, you, you do have a problem. If you don't have time for God, you got so much stuff in your life, man, your life is filled with weeds. Uh, that Jesus told in Luke chapter 8 a parable. And it's called, well, I call it the parable of the soils because it's really about the soil that the seed falls into. Most people call it the parable of the sower because the sower goes forth to sow the seed, regardless of what you call it. In Luke chapter 8, the sower goes forth. Jesus tells the parable, the sower goes forth and he sows the seed. And when he sows the seed, some of it falls by the wayside. Everybody say a hard path. Okay, some of the seed falls on the hard path that people have been walking on. And, 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 and he says, and the birds come down and eat the seeds off of the hard path. And then he says, and some of it falls on a rock. And because there's not much moisture, uh, it can't produce. And then some of it falls among the thorns. Everybody say weeds. Some of the seed falls in the thorns and they spring up and choke the plant out that produces out the seed and it goes away because it, it gets choked out by the weeds of life. And then he said, some falls on good ground and it produces uh, as much as a hundredfold what Jesus said. Well, his disciples didn't understand what he was talking about, which was pretty common. And they said, Jesus, can you explain to us about this parable of these soils here? What in the world does that mean? And so beginning at verse 11, Jesus gives them an explanation. Look at what it says. Now, the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. So the, the seed, the good word of God, that falls on the wayside, the devil comes and snatches the seed before it can take root in you, because if the seed ever takes root in you, you will believe and be saved. I Me mean, sitting in a worship service like this on your on, on your cell phone, just devil just snatching away any word that might go forth, scribbling and drawing and not paying attention, talking to somebody. I mean, walking out the door and the first thing you start talking about is, where are we going to eat today? And then somebody says, well, I want to go to... No, we went there last week. And by the time you get in the car, you can't even tell me what the message was about. The devil has snatched the seed out of you so that it can't root in you so that you can believe and be saved. But the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, they receive the word with joy and these have no root. Can't put a root down in a rock. Well, a weed can, but you can't. Uh, a good seed can't, right? How many of you have ever seen a weed growing in concrete? Really, seriously, right? Yeah. You couldn't get anything worth anything to grow there to save your life. Who, but, but they have no root who believe for a while. And in time of temptation, everybody say pressure and uh, deprivation. Yeah, heat and drought. And in times of heat and drought, they don't have any root and, 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 and they just fall away. Now, the ones that fell among the thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. But the ones that fell in the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. So, what are the weeds in your life? I mean, what are the concerns and the interests that sap the time and, the, and, and your energy and your, and your resources and your, and your finances in life and prevent you from bearing fruit? 
What are the weeds in life that keep you saying, well, if I had time, I would do that, Pastor I mean, what is it that you, Jesus mentions three varieties of weeds. He says the weeds of worry, which are cares. Those are the common little everyday cares and concerns in life that demand our attention. The things that just come up in the day-to-day issues of life. He mentions the weeds of riches, which are those weeds whereby we give ourselves to making money or becoming wealthy in lots of ways uh, to to the detriment of everything else in our life. Now, I'm not talking about, and Jesus is not talking about, making a living. We all have to make a living. So he's not talking about you working to make a living for your family to buy them a house and an automobile and get some air conditioning and some food and stuff. We're not talking about things like that. We're talking about that excessive, that excessive desire to, 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 to get ahead, you know, and, and, and to do everything possible and to spend so much time doing that that you don't have any time for anything else, including your family. So we have the weeds of worry, the weeds of riches, and the weeds of pleasure. I mean, this is, like, this is that chasing after the good life kind of thing. This is that, this is that thing where, where, man, I want to I wanna, I wanna have the good times of life. So those are the weeds that can sap our time, energy, resources, and, 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 and good heart and good will and good desire so that we can't produce the, the fruit that God expects us to produce led by his Holy Spirit. You know what weeds are? Weeds are a sign. A sign of what? A sign of neglect. You go by some places full of weeds, what's the first thing you know? Nobody's taking care of this place. Neglect. Man, we... we Brian and, and Justin and myself and Billy, we had, I don't know if some of you that live back in here in our subdivision probably drove by and you saw this big old giant pile of dirt in Billy's yard. And you probably thought, what in the world? Is he got a big pile of dirt in his yard. Well, we helped him take care of it. That dirt been there, what, a week or 10 days, something like that, maybe? And I, I pointed it out. I mean, it was so funny. Now, we, yeah, we... We've, it's been there about a week, 10 days, maybe. Pile, a big old pile of dirt. That's it. Nothing else. Just a big pile of dirt dumped out of the back of a dump truck. Week, 10 days later now, we're out there trying to spread it out and blah, blah. All right, we're getting it out of wheelbarrows. we all that, and we're starting at the bottom. to go. Well, when we got up to the top, right up at the top, there was about, about eight or 10 little weeds about that tall growing on the top of that pile of dirt. I said, look at that, Billy. I said, that right, it does, it, that right there proves the fall of man right there. Because the Lord said thorns and thistles will grow on this earth. And I said, look at here. This pile of dirt's been sitting here 10 days. There's already weeds growing on top of it. Man, you don't have, what do you have to do to grow a weed? Nothing. Nothing. You got to nurse a tomato plant. A, a tomato. Tomato plant. <laughs> my, my country was coming out of me. You got, to, you got to nurse a tomato plant, right? But you don't have to. You don't have to nurse chickweed or Johnson grass or nut grass or you know, No, you just you just neglect, and it'll just grow and take over. So when you neglect things, when you neglect your Bible, when you neglect your church, when you neglect your prayer life, when you neglect your Christian fellowship. Weeds just grow in your life because they are there because of neglect in life. And so in order to cultivate fruit, which Jesus describes as a productive life, we've got to, first of all, cultivate some roots, and then we've got to eliminate some weeds. And here's the third thing. This one is maybe a little bit more difficult. I just put cooperate with God. Because I didn't really know how to label, uh, get ready to get pruned. But that's what that means. Cooperate with God in the pruning of your life. You say, I got to cooperate? Yep. 
You sure do. Because if you don't, let me tell you what's going to happen. When he starts pruning, you're going to start crying. You're going to start complaining. You're going to start griping. You're going to run away. You're going to leave the people that you love. You're going to leave the people that can help you. You're going to leave the things of God because God's not being fair to you. So if you don't cooperate by having the kind of attitude you need to have when God starts pruning, then pruning's not going to do you any good. Pruning is a positive activity. Why do we prune things? Any of you guys that grow flowers or plants or, or fruit or anything, you know this. New growth, new flowers, new, new blooms, new uh, fruit, it just grows on new growth. You can't, you can't let a, an apple tree sit out there and grow to be 50 feet tall. Because if you do, it's going to put apples out on the new growth, which is right out on the end of that limb. And those things are going to be so heavy, they're going to just break those limbs off of that tree. you got to cut that thing back so it can be tight, so it can hold itself. So when the new growth comes on, the apples grow on the new growth. And it's not so big and heavy that it breaks everything down. I had this happen with a rose bush. I didn't know this uh, when we first, Tanya and I first got married for some reason. I, I, I had, I, I must have failed horticulture 101 or something. I, I don't know. I, I, didn't, I didn't have much. About, we grew a lot of vegetables, but I didn't know much about roses and stuff like that. But we had a rose bush, seriously. We had a rose bush that produced beautiful red velvet roses, gorgeous things. Well, uh, somebody gave it to us, and we planted it in front of our little trailer. We bought a trailer when we first got married, and that's where we lived, in uh, a, a house trailer. And, and we put out, had a little porch we built out there, and we put a rose bush that somebody gave to us, and that thing grew up, and boy, it had beautiful roses. Well, the next year, it had beautiful roses. Well, the next year, it had beautiful roses. The only bad thing is now it had grown about six feet out this way and about six feet out that way, and, and uh, the roses were kind of laying on the ground down here because they were out at the end of the limb. And, just, and so... I started asking some, I said, what in the world, man, you know? And then they told me about this thing about flowers growing on new growth and blah, blah. You need to prune that thing, what you need to do. So what I thought pruning meant is I thought pruning meant that you go up in there and just gently and delicately cut off the old dead branches, those old dead things and yellow things, you know, those things like that. No, no, no. no. So I, I did, that's what I did, and it still looked just the same. And then they said, no, no, man, you, you not only have to cut off the old dead stuff, you got to cut off some of that live stuff. I mean, you got to cut some stuff off that has beautiful roses on it this year. When those roses go off, get you something, man, and cut it back. And because, you know, it, it'll regrow, it'll do it again. But if you don't, it's going to just keep on growing. And pretty soon the roses are going to start looking small and nasty and tiny because all the, all the energy is going to produce the vine and the, and, the, and, and the rose bush and not produce the fruit out there on the end. So you got to prune that thing if you want it to look good and produce properly. You prune for two reasons. One is for shape and one is to stimulate. You want it to produce better stuff, prune it. If you don't, it's going to get weak and nasty and this fruit's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller and you're going to lose a crop. And it's going to look terrible. Cut it back. So when God prunes our life, God has to prune many times. Eh, let me just show you. John, John 15, again, our chapter, first two verses. I am the true vine, and my father is the wine, vine dresser. My father is the one with the clippers in his hand. Now, this is the good part, because remember, when you're being pruned, it's a God who loves you that's clipping you. It's not some old nasty preacher somewhere who's mad and is trying to hurt you, you know. This is the hand, this is God, God, the clippers are in God's hands and God is the one who loves you is the one who's going to be doing the snipping. You just got to remember that. Every branch, look, every branch in me, this is Jesus talking, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Now, I, I don't have time to go into this, but just believe me when I say, when, when you read that most of the time, you're thinking, okay, he's going to, it's an old dead branch and he just clips it off and throws it in the fire. That's not what that verse says. That verse says, it, Jesus said, every branch in me, in me. 
That means he's, a, he's saved. He's a Christian. Jesus said, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. That word is arrow, A-I-R-O, Greek word. It means to take up. It means to lift up. It means to take it off the ground. That's what it means. So what that verse is saying is, if you're an old branch that's laying on the ground, you're not producing fruit. You know why? Because when you're laying on the ground, you think you're a root and not a branch. And so what are you doing when you're laying on the ground? You're trying to send roots down. But you can't send roots down because you're not a root. You're a branch. And so you're spending all your energy trying to send roots down when you ought to be producing fruit. And so when God sees that, he picks you up off the ground, puts you on the trellis, so now you know you're a branch and you can start producing fruit. So every branch that does not bear fruit, he takes it up. He picks it up. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. Oh, that's the living stuff. That's the live stuff. God prunes good stuff in our life, stuff that's bearing fruit. I mean, that, 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 that wonderful uh, uh, business you've got that is producing and, and, and is growing and is, and is wonderful, you mean God might prune that out of my life? Well, he said every branch that bears fruit, he's pruning some of those. He's not just cutting old dead, stilted, lifeless dead wood out of our life. He's not just clipping sin and rebellion out of our life. He clips some good stuff out of our life. Why? So that we can produce even more fruit. He says, why does he do that? That it may bear more fruit. God takes those things, that, that good business, that satisfying relationship, that good health, that stuff that whenever something happens to it, we go, I rebuke you, devil. And, the, and God says, it ain't the devil. It's me. I did that. Because I know that you can produce greater fruit than you are producing now. And remember, the purpose is that God might be glorified by the fact that we bear a lot of fruit. That's the goal of the Christian life. That's the purpose. That's the production of our life, that God might be glorified if we bear more fruit. So when God looks at our life and sees even good things that could be better things, and he clips it, it's so that it might produce more fruit. Listen, one of the biggest mistakes we make is to, is to correlate punishment with pruning. Pruning is not punishment. Pruning is a loving God that loves you enough to hurt you so that you can produce even more fruit than you have now. And how does God prune us? Just simply, how does God prune us? All right, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Those are the fruit. How does God prune us? Well, if he wants to prune love, he brings people in our life with hate. We're hated. People hate us. People do hateful things. People come against us. How do I prune love? With hate. How do I prune joy? I bring some old sour puss into the life that doesn't have any joy about anything and grumbles all the time down the road, has no joy. If I want to prune joy, i got to bring some cosmic kill joy. Peace. Man, I bring somebody in. Uh, drama. Man, just bring any teenager into your life. That'll, 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 that'll get peace right there. I mean, that'll, that'll prune the fire out of peace, I, I guarantee you. Long-suffering. He brings people in your life complaining and griping. They can't even, I mean, any, anytime anything happens, it's not exactly what they want. They just start griping about it right there. They have no suffering, no length of suffering in their life. Gentleness. They bring old hard-hearted, heavy-handed a uh, hairy-legged joker into your life that can't be gentle at all. Goodness, how do you prune goodness? Bring somebody that's bad, that has bad ideas, bad thoughts, bad desires, bad this, bad... Yeah, see, you see what I mean? This is pruning. 
Now, this can do us good. God intends for it to do us good because it's going to help us produce more fruit in our life if we have the right attitude about it. If we don't start griping and belly aching and grumbling and complaining and accusing God of mismanagement and, and I'm going home and I'm, I'm not going to church because God's not being fair to me and run away from the very thing that's going to bless you in life. What is the right attitude? Look here, 1 Thessalonians. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And he says a bunch more stuff there too that I didn't put in, but that whole, that, the end of that whole fifth chapter just has all kinds of stuff like that. It just gives you this long list of stuff. That's the right attitude. So we cooperate by, by not allowing ourselves to be resentful and, 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 and rebellious and resistant and, and praise him and, and thank him and, and go with him and move with him and Honor him and love him and say, God, I don't understand, but I'm going with you, man. The clippers are in the hand of somebody that loves me, and I'm going with you, God. So if you want to be fruitful, you got to cultivate good roots. you got to eliminate weeds. you got to cooperate with God in this pruning thing. And then here's the last one. you got to wait for the harvest. The reason I put this one in is because I know a lot of people who go through a lot of things, and, and they just... You know, they, they do all right going through stuff, but then they get to the end of something and boom, man, they're just so impatient. Uh, to be, if I want to be a fruitful Christian, I've got to cooperate in understanding that God, growth takes time. You can grow a mushroom in two days. It takes 60 years for an oak tree to grow. So which one do you want to be? If you're, going to be, if you're going to grow with God, it takes time. Look at what Jesus said. Jesus said in John 12, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying that death precedes life. That a grain of wheat must die in order to produce fruit. And so we must die to ourselves, our agendas, our plans, our schemes, our ideas in order to produce spiritual growth in life. And listen, dying to your own selfishness takes time. And it takes God working in your life to bring you to the end of yourself. To show you yourself like you really are so that you can see yourself the way you really are so he can bring you forth and grow something productive in life. You know what our problem is? Our problem is we want to keep digging up the seed to check its progress. We put it in the ground. How many, how many farmers do we have in here? You ever been, you've ever been a farmer? Have you ever planted anything? All right, two or three days later, nothing. Four or five days later, nothing. A week later, nothing. Yeah, Rick, dig it up. <laughs> that thing ain't growing. So you dig it up and look at it. Well, now it's got to start all over again. Unless it's got a few little roots and hopefully you didn't kill it. But yeah, you don't plant something today and have a plant tomorrow. It takes time for things to grow. And so Christ will perform his work in us if we will remain. The key word is remain. What does remain? Remain means I, I, I still depend on him. I still trust him. I still count on him. I still hang with him. I still you know, keep in contact with him. I, I keep trusting him uh, to, to work it in his timing of things. That's... Uh, that's cooperation with God. That's, and know that it's going to take some time. And I know it's painful. And I know it hurts. And bless the Lord, I have been pruned so many times. I have been, I've had to wait on the Lord so much in life. But if you've ever been around someone 
who produces the fruit of the Spirit is perfectly obvious. When you're in their presence, life's just better. It's more joyful. You just sense love, peace, wherever they go. When they walk in the room, it just seems like peace comes over the place or something. That's the fruit of the Spirit. That doesn't happen by accident. That's a God thing. And if we'll remain in Him, don't quit. Don't quit. Look at your neighbor and say, don't quit. Hang in, man. Don't quit. Because he's taking you somewhere now. And, he's do- and, and, and this is a productive... Cre- you say, Pastor, what, what, is, what is a productive life? There it is. That's a productive life. So how you doing on it? Don't tell me now. I don't want to really know. I'm just asking that rhetorically. All right? <laughs> how you doing?